Thank you all for joining us for talk number three of our Educate to Elevate series. Um, we've got another nutrition talk tonight and are lucky enough to have Rachel Gorham and Kayla Colford joining us again uh, for this month's talk. If you happened to miss our first nutrition talk on nutrition basics um, after this evening's talk, feel free to head over to the Educate to Elevate webpage where you can can catch a replay of, of that talk. Um, tonight's talk with them is going to be focused on fueling logistics. So for those of you who weren't on our other talk, I'll quick do an introduction of, of both of our speakers for tonight. So Rachel Gorham is the performance nutrition specialist for TCO and Training House. Um, she's also a health and wellness specialist working with our employee wellness program and a sports dietitian providing nutrition care to individuals. Um, she completed her undergrad degree at Minnesota State University Mankato in dietetics with a minor in corporate and community fitness and went on to get her master's degree in multidisciplinary health and communication studies at Fontbon University in St. Louis. She's passionate about sports nutrition, being a lifelong athlete herself, and enjoys discussing fueling strategies leading up to and throughout competition and games and helping individuals improve their relationships with food and with their bodies. Kayla Colvard is the manager of Training House and TCO Nutrition Services and is a sports dietitian with the University of St. Thomas. And she's currently helping lead the development of their sports nutrition program. She's also a member of the US Olympic and Paralympic Committee as a sports dietitian and most recently traveled to the Olympic games in Beijing with Team USA. She completed her undergraduate degree and master's degrees at the University of Minnesota in nutrition sciences and completed her specialty practice in care of eating disorders and mental health at the EMILY program. Uh, her passions include athlete empowerment, and she's very interested in helping optimizing growth, instilling confidence in the kitchen, promoting positive body image, and positive relationships with fuel. Um, she's also passionate about empowering athletes to be the best that they can in every way, including mentally, physically, and especially through their nourishment. So with that, I am going to kick things over to Rachel and Kayla. Um, there will be a few interactive pieces uh, throughout the talk tonight, so be ready. There will be some poll questions that pop up on your screens, and certainly if you guys have questions, feel free to use the Q&A function or the chat. Um, if you use the chat, that'll just come to myself and our speakers tonight and we'll answer questions as we get to them. Awesome. Thank you, Dave. And thank you all so much for joining us tonight. Um, I know me and Rachel are so excited to get into this talk with you and um, are just very, very passionate about breaking down barriers that often uh, build the ceiling over our nutrition uh, accessibility and how we can use our nourishment all throughout the year and all throughout every season uh, to make sure that we can be the best um, the best athlete that we can be. Uh, so we're going to dive into here today. And really the biggest reason that we are looking at these fueling barriers um, is because your time as a student athlete is so, so sparse, right? We often look and focus in on our time around our competition and our training. And if you look at the big scheme in our life, that often comprises about 20% of our time. And now managing your energy levels as a student athlete has to fuel the entirety of your plate, the entirety of your life to make sure that we can maximize that time competing and that time training. So we really want to use that frame of reference to know that our fueling and our nourishment is going to be so important at every time of the day. Even as you sleep, a lot of people think that our bodies just like shut off when we sleep. However, even that time is super active and we have to make sure that we fuel that the right way. So we're going to dig in today um, first by addressing some of our nutrition barriers. So as Kayla said, lots of barriers that as dietitians, we want to make sure we can knock down anything that might be getting in our way. So I think of these as obstacles and a lot of athletes deal with obstacles during their training and same with nutrition. So let's talk about some of the most common uh, nutrition barriers here. So first off, 
let's make sure that everybody's on the same page and knows that they're not alone. So what are um, some of the barriers that you guys might face yourselves? We have a poll question here. What impacts your ability to fuel for training and competition? Few of our uh, answers here are not enough time for food, to make food, to prepare food, to pack food, to find healthy options on the road is really tough for me. Um, I may not know how to meal prep. Maybe I just don't have the skills um, developed yet. Or I don't always feel hungry. I might suffer from low appetite. Awesome, seeing some answers come in here. It's really spread. We can see that these barriers really impact all of our athletes and it's very normal. I want everyone to walk away today knowing that if you struggle with any of these barriers, you are not alone, right? And that's why we are here to help you. You have your support team um, to give you some tips and tricks. Okay. Awesome. So huge spread there. A lot of issues with traveling, which we will talk about today, maybe low appetite and such. But the main ones that we see when we talk to athletes have to do with time, with money, um, especially when you're traveling, right? Thinking about how can I pack things to fuel my success on the road, whether that's flying or traveling in a bus with my team. Maybe I lack motivation as one of my barriers, just motivation to prep food, to get the items that I need to meet all of my, my performance, my training needs, but then all of my needs outside of my athletic ability, like Kayla was mentioning, my sleep needs, my relationships to make sure that I can be attentive and focused in school. I might struggle from low appetite. I wake up in the morning and I'm just really not interested in food. Um, or I hit a really hard training session and I'm really not interested in food. Or I might need some skills, skill development, right? So the first thing with all behavior change, no matter what it is, even in your sport, right? Think about it. I need to get better at this skill or this drill. I'll use swimming as an example since I was a swimmer. If I needed to get better at my butterfly open turns, right? I first need to be aware or understand maybe what's what's slowing me down, right? Am I pausing on the wall? Am I popping my head up? Same thing with nutrition. I need to first just be aware of what um, is getting in my way. So if that's time or money, we know how to attack it, right? And that's how we will start this change. So we'll go and look at our fuel and training schedule. This is a really nice outline. So I like to look at this schedule and say, all right, this might be my gold standard, my 100% fueling ability. And know that not everyone might not, not everyone will be here right now. And that's okay. We're working our way up to this fueling schedule. Say if I have the afternoon practice, I can work in all of these functional meal and snack times. This is a good way to break down some of those barriers, right? To have something written out and understand that I am going to try to fuel my body and to meet my, again, not only sport and performance needs, but my overall human needs through this frequent meal and snack schedule. Okay. So how do we do this? I know it's really easy to talk about, okay, yes, I struggle with time or motivation or money, but let's actually put some, some action items down. So tip number one that we have is to map out your week to determine kind of your busiest days. So I think of this as, as an athlete, I would sometimes visualize my races so when I would visualize my race, I'm going through absolutely everything. I'm walking into the building, you know, from when I start to when I finish. Same thing with your week and nutrition. Maybe you see Wednesday is going to be a really busy day. I practice two times that day. I have to go to multiple sites. I also have school or classes. So how can I maintain that fueling schedule that we just saw, right? And so if we know that Wednesday is going to be a really, really hard day, what kind of things can I try to work into that day? And that might be putting some emphasis in our second point here on some critical fueling timeframes. So critical timeframes, I think of book ending my workouts, pre-practice, 
post-practice, right? I want to make sure that I'm upping my gas tank. I'm increasing my energy. And then I'm also allowing my body to recover from that stress, you know, hopefully with that high protein, good carbohydrate source within 30 minutes after, after practice or training. Okay. Some people need help with this just because, okay, the day's getting away from me. I do train twice. I go to class. I'm super busy. So setting alarms, so much success. I've found athletes setting alarms. And just a reminder, my phone is always with me. I'm getting these notifications all day. I might as well set these notifications to really keep me on track with my fueling to make sure that I don't go a few days really missing my mark. Also, another big tip is taking time on the weekend to plan ahead for the week, right? So the same way that we visualize or we might, you know, think about or prep for our races or our competition, let's prep for our week. So um, this might be meal prepping. It might be just restocking, getting groceries, and then making kind of your performance pack, which we'll show here on this next slide. Okay, so grocery shopping and getting prepped for the week. It doesn't have to be fancy. It doesn't have to be special or extravagant or take a ton of time. I sometimes challenge my athletes to actually time their meal prep. So a meal can be made in 10 minutes or less, especially if you come home from a really um, late game. Say my game was at seven or eight, right? I'm home 9, 30, 10. I still need a fuel. I need to get that recovery in. And what are some really simple, quick meal ideas that I can do? Well, we can pull from some prepped items. Maybe I have like a can or a bag of tuna, packet of tuna. Um, I get some microwavable rice and then maybe one of those steam fresh bags of veggies. I mix it all together with a really good sauce. I could be eating that meal in 10 minutes or less. Another really quick source could be maybe I'm scrambling some eggs. I get some toast, some peanut butter and jelly, super quick meal. It doesn't have to be fancy. It just has to be super functional for you at that time. And always thinking about mimicking those performance plates that we looked at during our first nutrition session. Okay. So our tips and this is one of my favorite things that I like to talk about, um, especially with athletes who struggle with time, if that's one of your barriers, is a snack pack, or sometimes we call it like a performance pack. So this is something that I will do to set myself up for success wherever I am. So I visualize this performance pack in my backpack, in my locker, at school, um, maybe at the gym or in my car too. So this is um, easy snack items that I know I can grab if I'm having that alarm go off on my phone that says, oh, it's a fueling time. Super easy, quick, accessible snacks. Applesauce pouches like those go-go squeezes, Nature Valley protein bars, trail mix, beef jerky, turkey jerky. Those are awesome options for this backpack snack pack. Another easy idea is meal prep smoothie bags, um, either in bags or in the actual container itself. I know a lot of people have like the Nutribullet or whatever kind of blender that comes with the individual serving. Easy way. And again, time yourself. If time is really, really your barrier, time yourself. Let's throw some fruit, some vegetables, a good carbohydrate source like oats in there, maybe some peanut butter, and then pack it in the fridge or in the freezer. And then in the morning, all you have to do is pull that out, add your milk or your liquid and blend it up and you have breakfast super easy on the go. Or this could be something that you have after school snack. Um, maybe it's a prep smoothie for your practice time. Again, hitting those critical performance times throughout the day. And then grab and go breakfast. I know a lot of people struggle with breakfast, low appetite in the morning. So if your barrier is low appetite, just I wake up in the morning and food does not sound good to me, then overnight oats is a really easy option. I'm sure if you have social media, you've seen some of these recipes, but overnight oats can be put together in five minutes or less the night before. Super simple. You get some really good carbohydrate sources, some fiber sources, and then a good amount of protein as well. And you can make multiple days in a row. I like to always add variety to this because we don't want any flavor fatigue, right? That could become a barrier down the road. So keeping it fresh. Um, one day we could have bananas and blueberries mixed in. 
the other day, maybe I had a chocolate peanut butter situation. So definitely changing up your flavors with that. Okay, here's our performance pack. So our performance pack uses these purposeful snacks. Remember from our first nutrition session, we talked about how our carbohydrates are gonna keep our energy up throughout the day. And our protein is gonna make sure that we can keep our muscle strength and continue recovering no matter how many training sessions we have. So awesome way to think about functional snacks is pick one, pick one. I, in my performance pack, usually have some options that can last, right? If I throw a banana in my backpack, I have to make sure to eat that that day. Otherwise, otherwise it might get a little, little nasty in there. So I might have some dry cereal, some pretzels. I kind of make my own like trail mix bag where I have popcorn and um, maybe some nuts, seeds in there and dried fruit. All of that can stay in my backpack or, you know, in my locker and stay fresh for a while. Now, if I'm going to be packing maybe cheese sticks, yogurts, those kind of things, always have them in a cooler, right? We want to make sure that we're thinking about food safety as well. All right. So once we're prepared, then we're often utilizing a lot of our nourishment on the go, on the road. Traveling nutrition is something that um, can often get in the way if we're not prepared um, in tackling some of these barriers um, that get in the way when it comes to our time and our effort for our nutrition. Um, so again, to make sure that we're not alone, let's take a look at our uh, poll question here. Uh, when we're thinking about our time traveling um, throughout our season. So what percentage of your season is spent on the road? Uh, we have, you know, 0%. I only compete at home. 10%. I travel, you know, maybe once per season, 50%, about half my games are away from home and hundred percent. I'm only competing away from home. I right, lots of input here. Awesome. So it looks like about 83% of us have about 50% of your games away from home. Um, and so that is a very, and it goes up from there to, and, you know, slightly down too, but that is a very significant um, number of our competitions that as we get ready and we're committed, we're engaged in our season, that we are expected to compete at our highest level outside of our normal environment. Um, so we want to make sure that we are utilizing the same uh, nutrition uh, practice and routine at home as we are on the road as well. Um, so there's a number of questions that we like to keep in mind. And again, circling back to that thought, awareness precedes change and making sure that we are aware of what we're doing, where we're going, what we need is going to be the first step in making sure that we are prepared for our nutrition on the road. Um, so where are you going? What is going to be available at that destination? How far away is that destination? How much time do we have in the car? Or do we have to be prepared for a flight? Um, what resources are going to be available for you as you get there? Maybe there's um, a coach or a parent who um, is putting together snack packs to make sure that you are ready. What resources are going to be there? And what are going to be at the hotel maybe that you stay at? Is there a, um, a continental breakfast in the morning where we can build a fueling plate? Um, and does your team provide any meals and snacks to be aware of? And then on top of that, are there any restrictions that you have in your own nutrition that you need to be extremely prepared for, even on top of all of those things and all those support mechanisms? Um, but a great thing to remember as we get ready for our season, as we get ready for our time on the road, is if we fail to prepare, that we're absolutely preparing to fail because our body's not ready, our nutrition mechanisms, everything that we have trained our nutrition to do um, won't have the power and the tools that it needs to do so. So that preparedness factor is going to be key. And the more we train our preparedness in that, the more routine it becomes uh, for it to be second nature as we continue through our season. Because there's very few times that postseason play is going to be at our home venue. So we have to be ready, especially come end of the season, to be at our absolute max potential. And that 100% is related to our nutrition preparedness as well. So the first things that we often work with with many athletes in relation to their fueling on the road then is creating a fuel plan. 
Um, so our travel time is going to be the first thing that we look at. And we provided a few metrics here uh, for you guys to really start to use, because sometimes it's like, you know, what do I do? How do I approach this time that we are traveling? And when our time on the road is between two and four hours, we like to make sure that we plan one to two of our purposeful snacks, like Rachel just showed you, um, for that drive time and planning to eat a meal right before we go or right when we arrive. If our time on the road is more than four hours, then we want to make sure that we do plan a snack and one meal for every four hours that we do eat on the road, eating again right before we leave and most likely as, uh, as soon as we get there too. It's a really important rule of thumb to make sure, and we've already reiterated this a couple of times today, but to have that meal or snack within every three to four hours. As soon as we pass that three to four hour mark, our body starts to go into that like hibernation state, right? Where it's like, it's starting to protect ourselves. So we want to keep our body firing um, so that our muscles can keep firing and be ready to compete at any point during the day. Um, so especially as we are growing athletes and athletes who, who have a, a lot of, um, kind of training and, and exercise mechanisms that need to be called on during our practices and during our competition, um, it's going to be a really great thing for us to keep in mind. We don't want to go over that three to four hour mark. Um, and then maintaining our routine, despite the change in environment, um, it can often be that as we are on the road and, you know, at the hotel, let's say with our team or just, you know, changing up um, where we are, we don't have our home kitchen available. We're eating at restaurants and, and sometimes we um, then rely on some of the other things um, and kind of splurge a little bit. But we want to make sure that despite the change in our environment, we are maintaining our normal routine. And that comes with consuming our typical foods and portions then in that. And I'll throw one caveat in there. We want to make sure that our portions and our foods are the right things um, as we get into consuming our typical. Um, so if we're not fully fueled, we got to get there first. But then as we are at our nutrition, you know, um, kind of routine is down pat at home, um, making sure that as we are traveling, again, it's not a time to necessarily overeat just because we're eating out. So getting really ingrained as to what portions make you feel at your 100% and trading that, getting really confident in that is very important. Um, bringing routine snacks and supplements with you. If your body is used to taking your let's say gummy vitamin every morning, that should be something that you do on the road too. Your body is in tune with that. It's ready for that. It's expecting that. It's not something that we want to change. We want that to still be available to our body as we're on the road. Um, routine snacks, things that your body gets used to, especially leading into your competition. Um, let's say, uh, I don't know, Honey Stinger Chews, for an example. That's one of my favorite. Honey Stinger Energy Chews are going to be a great pre-workout um, option for our fuel boosting snack. And if you at home and during practice are training that mechanism, training um, your nutrition muscles to use that and then work with that, we want our body to be able to rely on that on the road too. So looking ahead at your schedule and knowing how many trainings that you do have on the road, how many competitions you do have, and then making sure you pack that amount Sounds basic, but it makes a huge, huge difference in making sure that your game is on point there too. Um, sticking to familiar foods on the road, it can often be tempting, especially as we get to um, hopefully travel to some really you know, cool places, whether that's in the state and trying some um, new local restaurants, if we're traveling uh, throughout the nation and new states and um, lots of fun foods from, from each kind of area of the world, um, we do still want to stick to some familiar foods. Our bodies are going to be ready and geared up and have, um, you know, some stress and stimulus going into that competition. And if all of a sudden we try something and our body's like, oh, I don't know what this is. Maybe it's something that just doesn't sit well. We want to provide that confidence. So trying a new, I don't know, sushi dish the night before our, our uh, big game might not be conducive to our performance. So we want to make sure, we want to make sure that we are um, getting prepared for our familiar routine in that. Um, and on that too, maintaining a normal caffeine routine and, and normal for one person can be very different. Um, 
for another person. And sometimes you get on the road, it could be fun to stop at lots of coffee shops or there's a Starbucks at the airport or another Starbucks at the airport. And that can kind of throw our body off too. So we want to make sure if you're, if your body is used to, you know, caffeine at one time, it's okay to still use that within reason. And we can, I could get into a whole hour plus talk about caffeine. I won't today, uh, but making sure that you're sticking to your normal and not overdoing it. Cause sometimes uh, that can play kind of a different role in our body and how our body uses uh, fuel in a way that we don't expect. Um, and in the same way that if your body is used to having a little bit of caffeine in the morning, let's say a small cup of coffee, and and then you don't have that, that can sometimes disrupt our digestion and our fuel as well. So we want to stick to what's normal, what our body is prepared for. And then determining your hydration strategy. Oops. Often on the road, it is very, very um Sorry. <laughs> it's very, very difficult to um, stay in tune with our thirst because often travel um, disrupts our thirst and those receptors. And then how our brain is telling our body like, hey, yeah, you're thirsty and being proactive in that. Um, so bringing an extra water bottle to have with you um, to make sure that we kind of cover all the components of our hydration is going to be uh, very important so that we know we always have that hydration available. And then hydrating on a schedule. This is where the alarm clocks that Rachel noted could come in handy because as those thirst receptors are, are um, challenged as we're on the road, whether again, that is in the car or on a plane um, or any other way that we get um, to our destination, it is going to be important that we stay proactive and not wait until we're thirsty, not wait until we're dehydrated to hydrate, uh, but hydrating early and on a schedule to be proactive in that. And then remembering your electrolytes. If there is a specific electrolyte drink that you like and enjoy at home and that your body is used to, make sure to bring those on the road. Those little details can, can often get overlooked. And those are big components of how our body uses and regenerates its um, hydration and its fuel after you're done training as well. So remembering those early and often. And a Big uh, rule of thumb too, do not limit your fluid to prevent using the bathroom. I cannot tell you how many athletes I've worked with um, who have done this, like they don't want to go pee an extra time on the plane or it's a really long car ride. So we don't want to have to stop for the bathroom. It takes your body a good couple days often to get fully rehydrated um, if we kind of get to that dehydrated point. So even just that time, half a day to get to your destination, um, or even just forgetting all day when you're in classes can impact your performance for another couple of days um, coming up. So it's important that we, if we are thirsty, one, being proactive, but two, make sure that we're drinking instead of avoiding that. And we wanted to provide you guys a resource of some performance-driven travel snacks as well. Because again, as we're traveling, sometimes it could be easy to um, stop at the gas station and get our you know, favorite things that we might not often have at home. Um, Cheetos are one of my favorite on the road snacks. Uh, but I need to make sure that first I focus on those uh, purposeful and performance-oriented snacks. Um, so having and focusing in on your long-lasting fuel, what things can we incorporate all throughout the day to make sure that we are satisfied and that we are um, not getting kind of over hungry in between those three to four hour time frames. Um, but then also knowing that if I have to go and grab things on the go, um, what I can do for immediate fuel right before, during competition to give me that fuel boost to allow my body um, to get ready and in the zone and have energy to pull from instead of pulling from um, the muscles themselves. Um, and then our performance driven recovery as well and incorporating our recovery immediately after our training and competition, but also using um, these as ways to boost our protein. Often protein is um, the, the big nutrient that is limited in its access on the road, especially for traveling um, and on a plane and, and working through airports where there is a lot of um, a lot of access to restaurants, but not necessarily a lot of access to helpful options that give your body the amount of protein that you need, especially as an athlete. So having these um, on hand to supplement even the things that you buy on the road can be a really helpful thing. Like for example, if we're going to go and we find even a 
a deli sandwich um, on the go in an airport. And we're like, oh, okay, it would be, that would be great. But we also need, you know, twice the amount of protein that maybe they put one little slice of turkey on that and a fake piece of cheese, right? Um, then if we had our beef jerky in our backpack and a peanut butter pack and, and got an apple, like that made that like small um, and limited a nourishment choice into a full performance meal just because we were prepared and ready for um, anything that could come. And really adapting is going to be the name of the game when it comes to your traveling nutrition. So staying alert and adapt, it is going to be important that if for some reason our plans do not go as we do plan them, which happens often, that we can change it up and we can still be ready to go. Because no matter what, that buzzer is going to go Go time is going to happen. Your competition is going to be there and you are going to perform at your greatest potential. Um, so one big thing that I often hear is like, hey, I'm, I hit the gas station. The gas station was the only thing in this rural area of South Dakota, wherever we were traveling. What can I do to make sure that I have the fuel I need? And so a few examples here, um, you know, even some of the breakfast bars, Greek yogurts, the fruits that they have, and a bottle of orange juice in that provides the nourishment that we often need for a pregame meal in the morning. Um, midday meals, the deli sandwiches, pretzels, apples on a nut butter packet can be a great way to get to our performance plate, even at the gas station. Fueling snacks, we can often find applesauce squeezes, granola bars, and fruit. Um, and what's kind of cool is that a lot of the gas stations around have invested in to some of our recovery products, like Gatorade recovery bars and shakes, core power and fair life shakes. So we can have that grab-a-go shelf stable option, um, even when we do get stuck at a gas station for one of our meals or one of our fueling routines. And with that too, it's important to be aware of our food safety because the last thing that you or anyone wants to feel um, is like constipation and or GI distress, like diarrhea leaving you off the court, not what we want, especially on the road. Um, so a few things to keep in mind for this is avoiding unfamiliar foods. Again, one of those things where if it just doesn't sit well with your body and you don't know it until that time frame, um, we don't want you to keep, um, we don't want that to keep you from what you want to do within your competition. Um, ensure food is hot and cold if it is supposed to be. Um, a really great thing to do, especially if you travel often, is to travel with a food thermometer. There are like four three to four inches by like half an inch, very small. You could fit it in your backpack. I would encourage everyone just keep it in, even in their car as needed too, and definitely keep one in your kitchen. Um, but making sure if you are, you know, questioning um, the temperature out of food, or maybe it's one of those like open coolers, let's say at a gas station or at the airport on the go, and you are just like not super confident on that temperature, don't be afraid to ask um, and, and check the temperature in those coolers and those refrigerators, um, making sure that food that is supposed to be hot is served hot and food that is supposed to be kept cold is actually cold. That can avoid a lot of problems for you um, and making sure that you stay in your competition. Um, avoid raw foods, especially on the road, as much as possible, unless it's from a trusted food source. Um, you know, let's say raw fish, raw, raw eggs in that, things that are not fully cooked, um, unpasteurized milk in that sense, too. Um, it's going to be really important that you know, they, they're just at a naturally higher rate of a food board illness. And, and it's not something that we want a chance before a big competition. So we're just going to put a pause on those for that small time frame. Um, and then refrigerate your perishable foods within two hours um, and check mini fridges as you're on the road too and making sure that those temperatures are controlled and checked as well. Because I can't tell you how many athletes I have um, seen in the past who, you know, they we get to our competition destination, we sit down with our team for a night before game meal, we take home those leftovers and they sit on our counter for a while as we're engaging with our team and or maybe we have a long ride ahead of us still and, and we we still take those leftovers and we eat them four, five, six hours later, maybe overnight. I, I it wouldn't surprise me at this point. So um, make sure that that rule of thumb is that you have that refrigerated within two hours because that causes a lot of a foodborne illness if we do not keep those um, in control and you don't want to invest all that time to get to your destination only um, to get sick at the last minute in that too. 
Um, and then dietary restrictions. This is a big one that, again, we could spend the entire hour plus talking about, um, but we'll just brief on it today. Uh, for one example, we have a lot of gluten-free athletes that we support. And so making sure that there's just an extra level of preparation to make sure that we are ready to accommodate that dietary restriction. Um, gluten-free, for example, I have a lot of our athletes just travel with one or two bags of microwavable rice, uh, one large bag of gluten-free granola and a box of Bobo's bars, which is a great one for, um, for gluten-free athletes. And, and once you travel with that, then you are kind of set for all of those like lunch and dinner times where maybe a team is ordering a meal and gluten-free just wasn't communicated by accident or that restaurant just didn't have a gluten-free option um, available. And so that way we could just be ahead of the game. And, you know, it's a, it's a small amount of, of space that we dedicate to that to gain a lot of confidence and making sure that if, if, everything um, becomes inaccessible when it comes to that dietary restriction, at least we have that backup option. And a great app that we've used is finding gluten-free. Um, but talk to your coaches, again, over-prepare just in case, and even consider bringing your own appliances. I have definitely um, had athletes traveling with their own uh, mini toasters, toaster bags, and um, their own blenders, making sure that they have and they could use um, what they need during that time to feel confident and comfortable as like it's their competition too. All right, and well, thinking about some of these logistics, definitely after talking about, okay, travel nutrition, some of the unfortunate um, consequences of these things are digestive distress. So we'll get into that um, in a little bit, but again, we wanna do a poll question and kind of see what, um, what number of you have experienced any sort of digestive distress during training, competition, I will, absolutely hundred percent say, yes, I have. Um, some examples, if you're still thinking about it is loss of appetite, diarrhea, constipation, maybe gas bloating, maybe even, um, abnormal hunger cues or feeling hungry at different times of the day. Maybe that loss of appetite is throughout your whole travel time. All right. Looks like we have about 73% have experienced digestive distress. So that's a significant amount of people who have that barrier to their performance, especially during a competition or a training time. And what we want to provide today is some education, some background information on GI distress, some things that you can do to make sure that you're not taken out of the game, right? That you're still there at go time and you feel confident at go time too. So with this background, we want to think about, okay, our GI tract, which is your gastrointestinal tract, and thinking about this as a muscle, right? Just like we would think about our biceps or our quads or our hamstrings, right? This is a smooth muscle, a little different than skeletal muscle, but it's still a muscle that can be trained a hundred percent. And as athletes, we want to know that all of our skills, our drills, our performance mechanisms are trained at a hundred percent. And a lot of people don't focus on their GI tract. So today I want everyone to kind of create that awareness again, to lead to change moving forward. So what does our GI tract do? Um, it definitely helps us get our performance by absorbing, digesting, and making sure that we can get the hydration where it needs to go and get the nutrients where it needs to go. I also think of the function of our GI tract as almost like my army. If anybody's heard this term in the past, the microbiome or all of the good kind of bacteria that we have within our stomach and our intestines, that is protective to us, right? It helps boost our immune system. It's about 80% of our immune system too. So if we're thinking about how our GI tract is a muscle, we can train it, but also thinking about how it can work for us, right? When we're treating it properly and giving it the foods that we need for our overall health, but then for our performance too. So when we think about, okay, I'm having GI distress, whether that is appetite related, maybe bathroom related, there are multiple factors that go into this. One could be physiological. So knowing that stress, and we think of exercise as stress can cause these muscles to move a lot slower. Okay. 
I think about, okay, I'm going for a run or I might be swimming. All of the blood is going to be going to my exercising muscles, right? That's where my energy needs to go into my performance. It's not so much going to be focused on kind of that other nervous system, my rest and digest. So that can slow down some of this processing. If we eat maybe a super large meal um, and then we go into a training session or into a competition and that large meal was made maybe of some new foods or some really high fat items, things that are going to take a little bit longer to digest, that digestion rate might be even slower because we're telling all the blood to go to its working muscles. So different things to think about, especially when we um, want to prevent any sort of GI distress here too. The other thing I think about is um, any sort of appetite disruption. So if you have um, low appetite in the morning, like I mentioned before at breakfast, um, or maybe just low appetite after training sessions, understand kind of all of the impact that that can have on your training, but then knowing um, how your body is talking to itself or how your body is talking to you. So our big tip is to identify any sort of hunger and fullness cues. Um, I usually recommend athletes to do this on rest days, on moderate training days, and then on super hard, intense training days too. And even taking like some notes or maybe just in the note section of your phone, um, thinking about how is my body telling me that I'm hungry and how is it telling me that I'm full? So maybe on a rest day, Maybe I eat breakfast in the morning. You know, I have a family breakfast. I'm having pancakes, bacon, eggs, those kind of things. And then we go out and run errands. And before I know it, it's two or three o'clock in the afternoon. And I'm like, oh, shoot, you know, like, hi, I totally missed my fueling schedule. It's one of those days it's busy. So how is my body talking to me at that time? Do I notice kind of like that empty pit in my stomach? Is my stomach literally growling? Am I shaky? Am I dizzy? Um, do I have a headache or maybe am I a little bit irritable, right? Hangry is a real thing. So identifying those hunger cues can be the most important part because we're creating that awareness to then understand, okay, my feeling schedule might have to be changed a little bit. I might have to make, instead of those four hour breaks between my meals and my snacks, I might have to move that to three or maybe two and a half. Cause I know that that's best for me and my body. And then also thinking about how we know that we're full. Okay. We usually think of this like hunger and fullness scale, um, starting at one all the way to 10 is something I like to visualize. And I think of 10 being that over fullness, right? A lot of people associate that with potentially Thanksgiving, since that's coming up here soon, or this feeling of um, uncomfortable fullness, right? To the point where they feel sick. And we definitely want to make sure that we are aware of our fullness cues so that we aren't pushing our body to that limit, knowing that then that can cause some GI distress for us, but that we're more hanging out around this like six to eight range, right? We're comfortably full. Um, We are satisfied, right? If something was offered to us, we might say yes or no, if it's a really good option, but identifying these hunger and fullness cues are going to be important to setting up that fueling schedule for you and training your muscles. So, One of the biggest things athletes um, struggle with appetite wise is morning and then post training session. So if this is one of your struggles or one of your barriers, we encourage you to start small and be consistent. So for breakfast options, um, a lot of athletes think, you know, Rachel, I cannot do my whole performance plate at breakfast. That's just unheard of for me. Well, let's start small. Maybe it is just like an applesauce um, or maybe it's a liquid item, right? Maybe it's a protein shake or maybe just some, some juice that you can tolerate at that time. And what we'll do is we'll train that into our muscles. We'll do that for two, three weeks, just having that really small item so that their body gets used to it, right? We're training that muscle like we would do anything else. And then keeping that consistency. Same thing can happen after training, right? I have no appetite after training, but I know that I need to hit that recovery critical time frame. So I'm going to try um, some really simple items and stay consistent with that. So then my body can start cueing itself, right? And then I can start getting those hunger cues because I've trained it to want that at that time. 
And then always reaching out to one of us, right, Kayla or myself, um, to talk about how we can really train um, and schedule some of these things to make sure that we can almost um, like convert your appetite to then communicate with your body a little bit more efficiently. So what are some things, some takeaways, some practical solutions when we have these barriers? One of them with our appetite, we mentioned liquid calories or anything that could be super easy for you to tolerate. So when I think of our performance plates, it's a beautiful, um, big spread, very colorful. But when we have a low appetite, thinking about eating our protein, our grain, our vegetables, our fr you know, all of that can be very overwhelming. But if we were to make that into more of liquid calories, like a smoothie or a, a ready to drink shake, that can be a lot more manageable. And knowing that that's okay right? We're still getting that nourishment in our body and say an hour or two later, that hunger kicks back in and then we can focus on our performance plate then. But using those alarms can be another great thing to trigger your appetite to talk to yourself. If we're struggling with either constipation or diarrhea, know that hydration is going to be super important. So constipation, if we're not pooping regularly, right. And we feel like, um, we are backed up. We might feel a little bit heavier than normal and it's uncomfortable. That hydration is really important in making sure that we can draw fluid into the intestines, into those pipes, right. And push everything out. So hydrate, staying on a schedule, like Kayla said, and even adding an electrolyte beverage in is really important if you're losing a lot of fluid. So I'll add to this, if I'm having diarrhea or I'm vomiting, or, you know, I've had that during training or competition and I might anticipate it, unfortunately, I want to make sure that I am meeting my electrolyte needs to prevent any sort of dehydration that might lead to cramping and ultimately maybe not being able to finish my competition or unfortunately leading to some sort of injury as well. If I struggle with nausea, gas, bloating, again, taking those tips of being very consistent, training those foods in um, your nutrition muscles that you can be confident in. For example, using that time frame of, okay, those carbohydrate sources within, you know, an hour or two that are super simple foods, I know that those won't cause any nausea, gas, or bloating because they're going to digest really quickly for, for me and my body. If I were to choose, you know, a really high fat meal, I'm just going to use, you know, pizza for example, because I know that my body couldn't tolerate pizza if I went and swam a race, um, I know that that takes a little bit longer to digest. So I might choose that pizza after my race instead. And always um, keeping that familiar with yourself. When you um, think about nausea, gas, or bloating, um, it, it definitely can knock down your confidence. So having that purposeful and functional snack pack in your bag can be the number one tip or the number one thing that keeps you at your top performance uh, peak. And then any sort of food cravings. So honor your hunger cues. Remember, if we're trying to train your appetite, we want to make sure that we're acknowledging that our body is talking to us. So if you are hungry, make sure that you eat, right? Thinking about those purposeful snacks or that performance pack that you need, that you have in um, maybe your locker or your backpack at that time. Talk to a dietitian. We're happy to go through any of these um, GI distress issues. I love talking about our stomach. I always say my office is a very poop friendly zone. So we will talk about poop and it's, it's definitely helpful for you and your performance and especially your competition. Awesome. Well, and when we think about that and our digestive distress, our nutrition barriers, as they get in the way that can often lead to nutrition deficiencies. And so well, there are a lot of nutrients. Um, we're going to go ahead and pull up our poll here. And this is going to be something that in a lot of cases can uh, build a ceiling over our performance in ways that we are not even um, connected to. And, and some of the most common deficiencies that we often see with our athletes are iron, vitamin D, calcium, magnesium, and zinc, uh, potassium as well. 
And there's lots of causes um, that, that lead to these deficiencies. And, and often, as we just discussed, um, even poor gut health, that army, when it's not strong enough to really hold down the fort um, and allow our body to, to do everything that our GI tract or nutrition muscles do, um, then that poor gut health can lead to deficiency. And, and often fad diets and those diets that lead to low energy availability are not getting enough energy to sustain sustain what you need within your athlete's standard for your energy can lead to vitamin and mineral deficiencies as well. Um, and then genetics. Sometimes we just have a genetic uh, predisposition to maybe have a low iron or, or um, uh, um, different balance in our zinc levels too. And also lack of variety. That's one big thing that we see when we're um, not super engaged with all the colors of the rainbow. And we do that day in and day out and day in and day out. Um, leading to some of our deficiencies as well. Um, and while we could talk about any of these vitamins for a good hour in and of themselves, we won't do that to you tonight. We're going to focus in on um, iron and vitamin D and just giving you some um, quick tips as to identify those. And so first, iron. This is going to be um, one of the strongest and most correlated minerals that allows your body access to its energy, leading to your quality of health and performance. And so if you think about that, anything in your sport that relies on power, speed, explosiveness, your endurance, your access to energy in general, and anything that you do to move your body, your iron is a mineral that carries um, your oxygen and allowing your body to actually utilize all of those things that your sport depends on. And so when we do have a low iron, defi or a iron deficiency, it can really limit what our body could do. And we often see that in, in longer reaction times and longer race times too. So focusing on foods first, uh, we find iron in what a lot of people um, will recognize in red meats, poultry, pork, and tuna. Um, and, and it is a very um, a very strong nutrient in a lot of our red meat products. And, and when you see that kind of um, strong um, color in our, in our meats, uh, that is where, where iron can often be concentrated. But then we also find it in enriched cereals, tofu, lentils, oatmeal, beans, and spinach. Um, and a lot of these things in each of our food groups that could provide us with that amount of iron. Now you see the items bolded in the foods that are um, going to be a, a more um, absorbable form of iron. So the iron that's in our red meat our poultry, our pork and tuna in our um, kind of more meaty products are going to be easy, easier for our body to recognize and absorb. And then those that we find in our plants and in our uh, cereals are going to be just slightly less absorbed by our body and need a little more help from our other nutrients to make sure that we get enough in our body. And now as an athlete, just in general, you're going to have a very high iron need. And this increases as we as we get into kind of each of our different athlete cases as well. Female athletes, especially those who lose a lot of blood during menstrual cycles, rowing athletes, as you grow, your body expands the amount of blood um, that it has, and it needs more and more and more iron in that. So that is something that uh, male or female is going to impact you significantly, especially as a high school athlete, but also as you're growing and developing into our collegiate athletes as well. Um, and then those um, athletes who are who have some sort of dietary restriction, again, um, with within our vegetarian profile, if we kind of think back, which foods are most concentrated on our most well-absorbed iron, those are going to be meat and fish products. Um, and so that often does not fit necessarily into a vegetarian lifestyle. And so it's going to be something that is limited in that too. Um, endurance athletes um, and those who have a lot of like uh, repetitive, uh, repetitive force as well. If you're going for a long run, a lot of runs, you're breaking down a lot of the blood in your body just with that impact and you're, and you're using a lot of that mechanism. And so that's going to be something that increases your iron need. And then again, genetics. Some of us are predisposed to have uh, really low iron too. Now, some of the things we want you to be aware of are the signs and symptoms of when your body might be experiencing low iron or iron deficiency. 
And a few of these are fatigue and unexplained exhaustion. When your body's not able to take in as much, as much oxygen as it needs to actually utilize that for not only performance, but just like daily health, you can feel this just like hitting the wall every day. And even if you're rested, feeling exhausted, um, irritability, negative mood, low motivation to train, um, or to even stay engaged in class could be a really big side of iron deficiency too. Decreased aerobic performance. Again, if, if our um, race times are elongating, if we're not able to hit things that we know our body can handle um, and we're not able to adapt to all the training that we're putting our body through, that's going to be a, a potential sign of low iron. If we're sick much more often than normal, our immunity is not getting that oxygen that it needs. Um, and one big thing that happens over when we have low iron is appetite suppression. So our body is not able to talk to itself like we just noted with Rachel um, in a way to let you know like, hey, I'm hungry and I, and I do need my snack. I do need my meal. And then we feel like we're fully fueled, even though we are only halfway at our capacity. Uh, brittle hair or hair that is um, breaking as well on nails um, and feeling really cold abnormally, but maybe everyone around you uh, says it's warm. Those are going to be the big signs and symptoms of having low iron. Now, a few things that we want you to be aware of. Um, one, if it is reactive, or you're feeling some of the th some of these things, it'd be a really good thing um, to make sure that you get into your sports RD or your sports medicine provider for individual support. But proactively, we wanted to give you kind of one um, answer key to the test in making sure that um, as you go into your doctor, you're requesting them to test ferritin, which is like your storage of iron in your body and what we use to assess your iron proactively and doing this about eight weeks before your season starts and then thereafter annually so that you can make sure that your body is and has all the iron that it needs um, to thrive throughout that season. And then really engaging with our food first. And again, incorporating some of these iron sources in regular timeframes throughout your year. And then vitamin D is the other most common vitamin deficiency with um, athletes at any level and any stage of their growth and development. On um, the last study, there's actually only about 5% of athletes who are actually getting in the amount of vitamin D that they needed from their food. And now vitamin D, what's really cool about it is that it actually acts like a hormone in your body, um, like testosterone or estrogen or these things that you know, allow us to build muscle. Vitamin D does things the same way. And so it's a hormone for your bone and your muscle and your immune function that allows you to achieve your best health and performance. And so in that, again, focusing on food first, um, vitamin D is very concentrated in fish, fatty fish products, in the yolk of an egg, in our um, mushrooms that have been exposed to the sun, and then um, in fortified cereals, orange juice, dairy, and soy milk. Um, so it's not a very plentiful thing naturally in our food, fish, eggs, and mushrooms. And if that is not in every one of your meals, um, then we might not get enough vitamin D from our food. Now, the cool thing and the reason that vitamin D is often called the sunshine vitamin is because we can um, make this in our skin during the kind of summer and early fall months. However, the really, really important thing for us to know is that, is that especially as Minnesota athletes, is that during the winter months, even if you step outside and you go for a long run, maybe outside of the cold, but the sun is shining, it feels warm because we finally have acclimated at that time. The based on where the sun is and how strong those rays are, our body doesn't actually make any vitamin D during that time. So a lot of athletes kind of get in this zone of, okay, don't worry, Kayla. Like I, I went out of the sun today. I was there for 15 minutes. Like I got plenty of vitamin D that is only going to work in that late spring um, to early fall time frame. Now, being a Minnesota athlete, again, especially in the winter then, that's going to increase our vitamin D need. Being an indoor or winter sport athlete as well, we don't get quite as much exposure um, to the sun throughout that time frame is going to increase it as well. Growing athletes um, too is going to be especially important. And then anything that limits the effects of the sun too. So if we are very used to, even in the sun in the summer, wearing long sleeve, um, long pants, wearing tons of sunscreen, which I do want to make sure that 
that you do in the summer as well. That's still important. Um, the kind of even the darker our skin is, the longer it takes for our body to um, use and make vitamin D. Um, then again, our genetics. So all of these things are going to increase our body's um, need for vitamin D or um, limit how it's able to access that. So a few of the things that are correlated with our low vitamin D status are going to be low bone mineral density and stress fractures or bone injuries. When we have not enough vitamin D, our bones don't grow quite as strong as maybe they would have. Um, and that could be one contributing factor to that um, um, on top of a few others. Um, again, unexplained fatigue, unexplained muscle and joint pain as well. If we're like, hey, where is this coming from? I'm not sure. That could be uh, to, uh, to some point part in vitamin D. Um, and then frequent illness. Again, vitamin D plays a really strong role in allowing our immune system to function. Um, and it's actually really interesting because athletes who have like good vitamin D status, even if they get sick, are sick for less amount of time. So when we take our vitamin D and when we are aware of our ability to get that in, and then um, we can get you back out on the court, out on the ice, wherever it is, um, and keep you doing what you love at a greater extent there too. So a few next steps, again, if you recognize these signs and symptoms, or like what's going on, it would be a good point to reach out for support uh, from a sports dietitian. And then again, another answer to the test. When you are in with your provider in with uh, for your physical and want to be proactive um, in checking your vitamin D status, you can request, it's called 25 OHD or vitamin D um, from your sports medicine provider and doing this eight weeks before your season and then doing it annually after that if there's no other deficiencies. It's a really great way to get ahead of the game. Um, and being aware of what you need to do for your nutrition as well. And then circling it back, you know, when we're thinking about vitamins and minerals and, and we often maybe we'll take that gummy vitamin or, or whatever it is and, and try to supplement that. Supplements can bridge the gap for our nutrition, um, but they won't provide the plethora of what we need um, within our diet and it doesn't provide the full functionality of food. So keep in mind your athlete's plates. And as we get into our nutrition routine, getting ready to tackle these barriers and make sure that we do accomplish our nutrition goals, um, that before starting supplements, um, that we do uh, talk to our sports medicine provider, talk to your uh, sports dietitian, because we cannot out supplement a poor diet as hard as we try. <laughs> Uh, so with that, we have a few action items for you guys to jump in on. So if you have a pen and paper, have your notes, um, this would be a great time to start setting those snack alarms. Um, but we want you to um, take some time, reflect, right? One method um, to overcoming a common nutrition barrier that maybe is very present in your life. So. One example that we had was to make a weekly fuel plan that helps you plan those snacks and meals as well. Um, this one thing that you could do if you do lose your appetite or if you're starting to be disconnected to some of those hunger cues. So one thing that we put is focusing on your fluid energy. Maybe that's at that point, engaging in some of those um, ready to drink shakes or, or smoothies to get all your nourishment in one easy place for your GI tract and those nutrition muscles. <coughs> Excuse me. And then last but not least, recall those two nutrition tests, the nutrition labs to uh, use proactively. For iron, it's ferritin. For vitamin D, it's called 25-OHD. Write those down, put them on a post-it note as you go in for your annual physical or your next checkup. Make sure that you check those and try to check them proactively because then we could do so much more to making sure that we don't build that ceiling lower than it has to be for your potential. And then with that, we do want to open up um, to see if you guys did have any questions. So we will stay on for a few minutes here um, to see if there are any questions that do come through the chat individually as well. Thank you, guys. So I don't know if everybody can see, but there were a few questions that came through that Rachel had typed the answers out to. So I just wanted to ask them out loud so you guys can, can talk through those too. Um, so one person asked, should you have electrolytes? 
electrolyte drinks with your snacks or just after training? So I'll kind of expand on my response here. Um, both. I mean, it definitely could work beforehand and after, but I usually think about preparing for my practice or my training, especially if we're thinking more summer months, it's going to be a really hot, humid environment. And I know my sweat loss is going to be great. Then I want to make sure that, okay, I am preparing my body to have all of those electrolytes to make sure that my contraction, my relaxation of my muscles is going to be on point. Um, the thing is that we don't want to be so reactive, right? So that we're only doing that electrolyte after our training or to the point where we might be low in that area or even dehydrated too. So if you know that your training is going to be um, maybe a little bit longer today or higher intensity, then introducing that earlier in the day is a good choice. Um, great. So someone else asked if you're a larger athlete, should you eat larger meals and snacks? And maybe even a step further, how do you decide how much you should eat for meals and snacks and what goes into figuring that out? Yes, there are so many things that go into that. Um, but one, starting with those hunger and fullness cues, kind of as Rachel described today and, and thinking about, you know, where I am in my hunger and, and knowing that it's, you know, it's okay to, to, you know, get to each of those meals and snacks and, and get to that, you know, six, six to eight. Um, if your body is feeling like, like you are, okay, I'm very hungry. Like my stomach is growling. And even though I'm looking and like matching my plate to this picture, like I'm still hungry, honor that that's important. Um, and then as we get into kind of your meals and snacks, sometimes, um, knowing that it's going to be okay to have more snacks, let's say, than the average individual, um, because you do have a higher standard for your nutrition, one as an athlete, and then two, as your body just has a larger frame, you're going to need more energy to sustain that, especially if you have goals to actually get ahead in your functional mass. Um, actually, one of one of the upcoming Educate to Elevate sessions is going to be on, on that like functional weight gain and working towards that, especially um, within our different body frame. So I would definitely encourage you to tune into that too, because um, that'll help kind of dive in and decipher that as well. Great. Um, someone else asked, does hydrogen water do anything or is it just fluff? Hydrogen water specifically, I don't know of many long-term or extensive research, especially with an athlete. So Kayla, correct me if I'm wrong, but I haven't seen anything that um, studies this use, especially in athletic performance or any benefits that it can give you in a large enough group that we could apply it to most athletes. So for right now, I would say not a lot of research behind it to support it or implement it into your fueling schedule. Mm -hmm. And if we think about, you know, what water is, what we need it to do, regular water is going to do all of that. So we don't even need to start to gamble with these different things that are not science-based and where we know that water and the electrolytes that we use are going to provide all the functionality that we need without gambling um, within that as well. Another question came in, how many times should you hydrate a day with water? Yeah. Yeah. It, to be honest, it's a good rule of thumb is to sip, don't chug. Right. And so your body could only like absorb like between 32 and 38 ounces at a time. And that's actually a lot at the time. So don't, we don't want to just gorge on water more than that. So we're not going to be able to absorb it properly. Um, to, to, but to make sure that you do have, I mean, at every meal and snack. So for, you know, athlete standard, that's going to be three to four meals and three to five snacks a day and, you know, eight, nine, 10 times. Um, but starting with a good rule of thumb for hydration, and you can circle back to the first educate to elevate session too, to learn a little more about hydration basics as well. Um, but about half of your body weight um, in pounds. So if I'm a 300 pound person, then I'm going to take half of that as 150 and starting in that for ounces of water or hydrating fluid a day, and then break that up into all those eating That would be a great way. Uh-oh, 
Did we freeze? I think we lost Kayla there. Oh no. Well, I'll continue kind of her sentiment. Um, oh look, Kayla, are we back? Yes. <laughs> okay. <laughs> awesome. So kind of to wrap up what you were saying, thinking about, okay, our minimum hydration needs, spreading that throughout the day and putting it into our schedule like we would with our alarms. Absolutely. Awesome. Um, we got a question that came in from one of the coaches that's joining us today. Um, so he says he frequently gets asked, you know, what if my family doesn't have a lot of money and there's not a lot of food at home? What are some options for someone in, in that situation? Yeah. Absolutely. We struggle with um, these issues throughout all of our athletic population, right? If they're youth athletes all the way to sometimes our pro athletes as well. Um, so if you are trying to fuel on a budget, um, thinking about what are those critical timeframes that I definitely want to support um, and making it super simple. So taking out kind of I like that fluff word that we used earlier, taking out all the fluff or the fanciness and thinking about what does my body need at this time? What could be super simple and effective? For example, um, maybe I can't, uh, you know, afford all of the fresh produce at this time, but it's going to be a lot more sustainable for me to have maybe the canned fruits and vegetables, or maybe some frozen items. And knowing that if I'm buying some of those frozen items, I can still be confident in that nutrient profile that I'm getting from it too. Um, so I think there's some tips and tricks for that. There's also different programs that could be helpful depending on the school that you're associated with, um, or potentially your income too. And, um, you know, if any of the coaching staff or ATs or any members want to reach out to me or Kayla, we can give you some more information on those programs as well. Yeah. And just being able to encourage too, if you're in a high school setting, school lunches are not bad. Um, and, and they, well, they often maybe don't hit the full athlete standard. They're great starting points that sometimes we just add those quick, easy and uh, budget friendly snacks too, to make sure that we get the full energy need that we need going and leading up to practice, but they're not necessarily a bad thing. And sometimes there's a lot of pressure in the high school setting to stay away from those. Um, even if, if those are going to provide us with awesome energy and an energy in and of itself to, to get us our pregame pre-practice meal to allow us to thrive later on in the day. Awesome. I'm not seeing any other questions rolling in. So I want to thank you both for, for speaking again tonight. Um, and also wanted to thank everybody who joined us. For those of you that stayed on a little bit late for the Q&A session, we definitely enjoy engaging with folks that are attending our, our talks too. So as you can see on the screen next month, we've got a talk uh, with the NSCA talking about recruiting and kind of some different things that you can do to set yourself apart from other student athletes vying for for some of those spots and then in January we've got our partner premier sports psychology that's going to be joining us so keep an eye on your emails on social media all that good stuff for future details and we hope to see you then thanks everybody